Namaste. So far, we've been going through this conversation between Yajnavalkya and the emperor. And the emperor is leading him on with these questions. What serves as a light for a man? In other words, what is it that reveals the world around us so that we can perform our actions, do our work, and so on? And the conversation is going in a, a very interesting direction because each of the lights mentioned by Yajnavalkya in the beginning is temporary, material. And then in each succeeding question, the king says, but what about when that material light is finished? Because everything in the material world is temporary. So finally, this chain of inference leads to the self as the light. The self, of course, is Brahman. Now, Brahman is not material. It's invisible, imperceptible, inconceivable, and so on, because it's transcendental. Anything that is truly transcendent has no form and does not appear to the senses in any way. So, this is by definition. But there's always going to be a class of people who refuse to accept this. And it's really amazing how in his commentary, Shankaracharya anticipates this argument. Even today, the arguments of the materialists against consciousness being transcendental, against the self being the absolute, are couched in exactly the same terms. It's uncanny. There has to be a reason for it. And I think the reason is this, that people who are focused, who are committed, who are obsessed, actually, to stay an, attached to external consciousness, jagrat, are always going to come up with the same basic argument against consciousness. They're going to say, well, it's something material. It's not transcendent like you claim it is. And then they trot out a bunch of arguments dressed up in whatever philosophy is fashionable at the time. So let's take a look at this kind of argument, and then we'll see how it comes into even the present day discussion about consciousness. Objection by the materialist. No, for we see that only things of the same class help each other. You are wrong to state as a proved fact that there is an inner light different from the sun, etc. Why? Because we observe that the body and organs, which are material, are helped by lights such as the sun, which is also material and of the same class as the things helped. Here, too, that is, in the discussion about the self, we must infer in accordance with observed facts. <laughs> Supposing that the light that helps the work of the body and organs is different from them, like the sun, etc., still it must be inferred as being of the same class as these, for the very reason that it helps them, as is the case with lights such as the sun. Your statement that because it is internal and is not perceived, it is different from lights such as the sun, is falsified in the case of the eye, etc. For lights such as the eye are not perceived and are internal, but they are material just the same. Therefore, it is only your imagination that you have proved the light of the self to be essentially different from the body, etc. <laughs> this is great. This is exactly the way that people today talk about consciousness and exactly the way they get it wrong. <laughs> they say 
that consciousness is material and it's caused by something material, whether it's neurological brain functions or some kind of, you know, hand-wavingly obscure quantum mechanics bullshit. <laughs> they don't take the simple answer. You see, there's a principle in investigation, any kind of investigation, but especially a scientific or philosophical investigation called Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor is the principle that given you know, two or more different theories to explain a certain phenomenon, the simplest and most direct one is the truth. And this is a heuristic. A heuristic means it's not strictly logical and scientific, but it works most of the time. <laughs> and, and this applies in this discussion as well. Now, the argument or the theory that consciousness is ultimately transcendental and is a function of the self, which is Brahman, and which is not material, cannot be perceived except through its effects. This is a simple argument. This is a direct argument. Consciousness is the self. Boss, finished. Okay. But because they cannot accept that anything really is non-material. The materialists argue against it with all these complex and obscure arguments that delve deep into completely unverifiable theories. Well, for example, that consciousness is due to brain function. Well, maybe you believe or you would like it to be due to brain function or some kind of weird quantum effects or something, whatever your theory is. Maybe you would like to believe that because it fits with your worldview. But in fact, you cannot raise any evidence. You know, you cannot present any hard evidence, any empirical justification for the fact. And the arguments that you do raise are all subject to falsification because none of them show a direct connection between whatever phenomena you're talking about and consciousness. And the reason for that is consciousness is not dependent on any phenomenon. <laughs> consciousness is independent because it's absolute. It is rather the support of all the other phenomena. Now, when we understand it in that way, and when we see it with the transcendental vision, it all makes sense. Everything falls into place. All the phenomena are explained clearly. But the materialist is undeterred huh? because his is essentially a religious belief. And he's wildly experimenting with this and that, trying to find some factual support for it. And he's willing to take grand leaps <laughs> of uh, disparate, disconnected have, uh, phenomena having nothing to do with one another to make his case. And the same is true here, 1,250 years ago. So, the, I mean, we can pick this apart with a fine-tooth comb. Uh, everything the, the materialist says only things of the same class help each other. Well, this is completely wrong because the self supports the body. The self is life. It supports brain function and quantum entanglement and all this other stuff that people talk about. And when the self leaves the body, all of that is finished. This is the point. Life and consciousness are inseparable. This is why computers will never be conscious. They may become very good at imitating conscious entities, such as human beings, but they will never actually be conscious because a priori, they're not alive. 
and we see that consciousness and life go together inseparably. Consciousness does not manifest in any form outside of living beings. And, of course, the scientist is going to be against this because he can't control living beings. He can't control life. He's not cause over life. He's only cause over his little laboratory with all his silly experiments. <laughs> Which, in order to explain or control anything, requires laboratory conditions, which means he has to narrow the context to the point which reduces the number of variables to a number which he can understand and control. You see, this is the dirty little secret of science. Science and engineering only work in a controlled environment. Out there in the jungle, in the wild, it all breaks down, isn't it? I used to be a field service technician for Hewlett Packard. And Hewlett Packard, back in those days, before it got taken over by MBAs and ruined, was a really good company that made scientific measuring instruments. So, you know, I know my way around a scientific lab because I used to work on all these instruments. And I can tell you, <laughs> we were in charge of or supporting White Sands Missile Test Range. And they had these, some of these instruments way out in the desert, out in the middle of nowhere. And after a few years, <laughs> they would all break down pretty much in the same way due to incursion of dust and dirt. And so one of the things we had was a, a big pressure washing hood where we would put the instrument in there and pressure wash it like anything with solvent and then let it dry. We had a, a fans and everything. You know, it was a big deal. And right coming out of that would usually work just fine, 90% of the time. Well, one time we had this instrument that wouldn't, even after washing, it just wouldn't turn on. So I got this thing and I was taking it apart. <laughs> and just as I got the cover off, my boss happened to walk by behind me and we looked in there and there was a dead mouse. <laughs> Some poor mouse had somehow gotten across high voltage and was electrocuted. And so uh, <laughs> my boss, who is this, this, you know, salty Texan guy, says, no wonder it don't work. The engineer's dead. <laughs> the whole lab burst out laughing. But, you know, this is the problem with technology. It cannot survive except in a highly controlled environment. That means indoors, clean, no, you know, other life forms and so on. So the same is true of these arguments, these so-called scientific arguments about consciousness. They can't survive. They can't function except in a controlled environment huh? where you have somebody wired up to EEGs and EKGs and whatever, you know. And even then, the only evidence they supply is that there's a difference between waking consciousness, sleeping consciousness, and so-called unconsciousness, for example, when a person is under anesthetic. In those states, the brain waves and the nerve functions and whatever are different. Well, so what? You still haven't proved <clears throat> that these brain functions cause consciousness. You've only proved that there are certain physical characteristics that change with the change in consciousness. So the causality could just as easily go the other way, and that the change in consciousness causes the change in physiology. Actually, that's a much simpler argument, because then consciousness is just one thing, and it only changes in its focus, where its attention is directed. When the attention is directed outward through the senses, we have waking consciousness, jagrat. When the attention is focused inward on the mind and thoughts, we have swapna. 
And when the attention is focused on nothing, we have sushupti. When the attention is focused on itself, we have turiya. These are the four states of consciousness. So this is so simply explained by this theory of consciousness, this Vedic or Upanishadic theory. Why go to such lengths to explain it indirectly? Well, because like I say, it's a religious belief of the materialists that everything is material and has material causes and explanations. I could go on and pick apart all these arguments, but basically the same function is there in all of them. That, oh, well, everything that consciousness reveals is material, and so consciousness must be material too. But wait a minute. What about when consciousness reveals the mind and thoughts in Svapna? But what about when it reveals emptiness or nothingness in Sushupti? Is that material? Can you prove that? I don't think so. So anyway, the materialist <laughs> goes on. Moreover, as the existence of the light in question depends on that of the body and organs, it is presumed to possess the characteristics of the latter. Your inference, being of the kind that is not based on a causal relation, is fallacious because it is contradicted. And it is by means of such an inference that you establish the light in question, the self, to be different from the body and organs, like the sun and so forth being different from the objects they reveal. Besides, perception cannot be nullified by inference. And we see that this aggregate of body and organs sees, hears, thinks, and knows. If that other light helps this aggregate, like the sun, etc., it cannot be the self any more than the sun and the rest are. Rather, it is the aggregate of body and organs, which directly does the functions of seeing, etc., that is the self, and none else. For inference is invalid when it contradicts perception. <laughs> this is like ignorance personified. This is like, this is perfect, huh? Perfectly stupid. He's saying that because you are inferring the existence of something invisible, imperceptible, the inference is not valid. Well, wait a minute. There are plenty of things that scientists infer that are invisible or that were up until recently invisible, such as atoms, such as electromagnetic fields. I mean, the list goes on and on. Infrared and ultraviolet radiation, and et cetera, et cetera. So many things that scientists infer. What about gravity? Gravity is invisible. But is anybody going to argue against it just on that account? <laughs> is that going to set you free from the influence of gravity? Nonsense. So all these arguments are fallacious. And why they're fallacious is, like I said, the materialist has a committed belief in materialism. Ism means a philosophy or a belief, a worldview. And then everything is filtered through that worldview and accounted for in terms of that worldview. So when a person's worldview is restricted to Jagrat consciousness, where he doesn't think at all about other states of consciousness, such as dreaming and deep sleep, all those are unconscious. Huh? In today's psychology, they're called the unconscious or the subconscious. See, but actually they're just different states of consciousness. It's the same consciousness but its attention is directed in a different way. Its objects are internal rather than external. That's all. But see, to a materialist, any consciousness that is internal is equivalent to unconsciousness because it's not about the physical world. This is compulsion. This is obsession. This is ignorance. 
because the human being has many more states and many more possibilities. And as we go through this material, this, what is it, 107 pages <laughs> about dreaming and deep sleep, we're going to unearth principles that prove that what we call dreaming and deep sleep are actually more powerful states of consciousness when it comes to creative potency than waking consciousness. Waking consciousness is where we experience the effects of the causes created in deep sleep and dreaming. And this is also borne out by the Buddha's theory of Paticca Samuppada. And we'll, don't worry, we'll explain all of this in great detail in the proper places. But for now, I just want to say that there is a whole very scientific and very provable and verifiable theory of consciousness that begins from the fact that the self is independent and transcendental. And this self, by means of different states of consciousness, creates the whole very world that we see, as well as the body and senses and so forth that sees them. So this is where we're going to go in this series. So let's just go through the rest of this objection, and then tomorrow we'll discuss the answers to it. Reply. If this aggregate be the self that does the functions of seeing, etc., how is it, remaining as it is, it sometimes performs those functions and sometimes does not? Ha <laughs> ha! Gotcha! Sometimes we see things through the senses and sometimes we don't. Sometimes the body is active, sometimes it's inactive. But consciousness is never inactive. Consciousness is always present, even when the body is inactive, as we pointed out earlier. In dreams and deep sleep, simply the focus of consciousness is changed. It's internal instead of external. And it's in the state of deep sleep, it's devoid of objects. But that doesn't mean it isn't present. It's fully present and still aware. And that's why we remember sleeping deeply, even if we don't remember anything about it. Because we are still conscious. It's just a different state of consciousness. There's nothing wrong in it because it is an observed fact. You cannot challenge facts on the ground of improbability. When you actually observe a firefly to be both luminous and non-luminous, you do not have to infer some other cause for it. If, however, you do infer it from some common feature, you may as well infer anything about everything, and nobody wants that. Nor must one deny the natural property of objects because the natural heat of fire or the cold of water is not due to any other cause. You see, these spurious arguments, which have nothing to do with the actual point, are similar to the arguments raised by the so-called scientists and philosophers, materialists of today, who talk about all kinds of pseudoscientific mumbo jumbo in an attempt to overwhelm anyone who has a direct knowledge of the self, which is potentially everyone, because everyone is the self. <laughs> See, this is the point. The scientists are looking for something objective, outside, external, in Jagrat consciousness. And they say that anything which is not directly perceptible by the senses is invalid. So any theory or any observation made with the mind alone is not worthy of consideration as a fact or as a theory. They say you simply have to observe the physical facts, just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> And, of course, this is missing a whole lot. This is missing 75% of our experience because it's denying the more subtle and more powerful states of consciousness 
Swapna, Sushupti, and Turiya. Suppose we say it, it all depends on the merits or demerits of people. Objection. Then those merits or demerits themselves might habitually depend on some other cause. In other words, if you have good karma, if you have a developed intelligence, then you can see consciousness for what it is. If you don't, they will be covered by upadis, which are ignorance, directly, factually ignorance. And because of that, you will not be able to see beyond your limited range of vision, whatever it is that you understand things to be. This is going on even today, this same argument, just in different terms. So what if they do? It would lead to a regressus ad infinitum, which is not desirable. But you see, this is projection. This is exactly what the materialist is doing. They are observing phenomena within phenomena within phenomena within phenomena, never coming to any final conclusion. This is a regressus ad infinitum, exactly, because they refuse to accept the fact that consciousness, or to be more precise, the objectless awareness of the self, is the absolute, is the ground of being is what people call, for lack of a better term, God. So this Brahman, this self, is actually the cause of everything else. Or well, not directly the cause, but everything else kind of grows up around it spontaneously, without the self doing anything. And so we are always surprised to wake up in a body, in a world, seen by senses that are external to consciousness. If we're not surprised, it means we're not paying attention. If we're not amazed, uh, Ramana Maharshi one time was talking about the experience of the Jivan Mukta, the enlightened being who is still living in a body. And he said, well, we don't desire anything or anticipate anything but we just sort of take a look around and see what kind of amazing things are going to develop. In other words, he's not trying to cause anything. He's not trying to do anything. He's not trying to get anything. He doesn't desire anything. He doesn't want anything. He is simply waiting around and seeing what happens? And whatever happens, it's going to be surprising and amazing. And if we look at the world, the world is a miracle. The world is beautiful. The world is incredible and deep. Like I said, phenomena within phenomena. But it all stops with the self. Where it begins is also where it ends. So the self, being the absolute, Brahman, is both the cause of everything and in some way the effect of everything because it sees everything through its awareness by means of consciousness. But in the ultimate issue, it doesn't do anything, nor is it actually affected by anything. All these phenomena come and go in their appointed time, according to the laws of material nature. And the self actually has nothing to do with any of it. But the self is always the witness, is always the watcher, is always the knower. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>